Welcome to the house of the Lord on this sixth Sunday of Easter. I want to welcome you who are here present and also those who are viewing our service online. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. The psalmist says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the whole earth. As we come into God's presence, we lift up God's name, receive uh, from God in his holy word, and are fed through the sacraments to go and be the people of God in the world. I invite you to join with me uh, by turning in the Book of Common Prayer to page 355, or in your online version, let us worship the Lord. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading and hearing of God's word. The first reading is from the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 16, verses 9 through 15, which may be found on page 900 in the Pew Bible. In the first reading from Acts, the Apostle Paul travels to the region of Macedonia following a vision he receives. While in Philippi, Paul meets Lydia, a businesswoman who is led to listen to Paul's message. In so doing, she and her household are baptized. A reading from Acts. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we Im he immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas, took a straight course to Sacramathrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, where a re which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. 
We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we were supposed that there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 67 and may be found on page 675 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us read it together responsibly by whole verse. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity, and guide all the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. May God give us his blessing. And may all the ends of the earth stand in awe of him. In today's reading from Revelation 21 and 22, God's purposes for the cosmos in the new heavens and new earth are described in a glorious vision full of rich symbolism from scripture. A reading from the Revelation to John. In the spirit, the angel carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring it into their glory and to the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to Judas, not Iscariot, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Please pray with me. Or take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. And take our wills and mold them and make them yours. To the honor and glory of your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Michael Green, the British evangelist who died just a few years ago, writes in his book, I believe in the Holy Spirit, that one of the jobs of the Spirit is to work on a person's heart to make Christ attractive to him or her. And he notes that this can very often happen during preaching. But then he says that one of the greatest weaknesses of contemporary Christianity is the, is the poverty of preaching. And he writes this, many clergy consider it a chore and many congregations complain if it lasts more than 10 minutes. And then he adds, there seems to be little expectation that the Spirit of God might be present and active to take home the Word so that the message or some part of it become luminous, indeed life-changing for one here and another there in the congregation. Has that been your experience? And we're not talking about a human show where the preacher is an is a uber communicator, a superstar, but rather when the sermon hits home, finds a resting place, resonates within you, in our hearts. In my younger life, I was blessed to hear and sit under good preaching, but then also sometimes uninspiring preaching as well. But sometimes a particular sermon uh, would really hit home. Well, today we have in the scripture in front of us the story of Acts um, from Acts 16. We have there a story of how the Spirit moves through the proclaimed Word of God and the story of the conversion of Lydia of Thyatira in Philippi. But before we get to this delightful account that we have of the Word of God, the Spirit of God resting and opening up Lydia's eyes and heart, I want us to consider also the first part of the passage and, and around this question, two parts of this text today, but around one question, how does the Spirit lead? How does the Spirit lead? You know, in a couple of weeks time, two weeks in fact, uh, is the Feast of Pentecost. Feast of Pentecost is the, is the highlight of the church calendar year uh, for the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit is present whenever we gather. So how does the Spirit lead? 
Another way of asking that question is, how do we know God's will? How do we know God's will? We have two examples this morning of how the Spirit leads. It's an important question. I'm sometimes asked by younger people, and today we're honoring the graduates, both youth from St. Gabriel's and, and our own community here, but also grandchildren and so on across the country uh, today. But sometimes I'm asked by young people, how do I know what is God's will for my life? How do I know what vocational path to follow or big questions, especially when we're young and we're starting out and trying to make some big decisions in life. But it's not limited to young people. I assume that many people here have asked the question, how is the Spirit leading in one way, shape, or form or another over the course of this past couple years? We might put it this way, when do I know that it's time for me to retire? I'm not, I'm asking that rhetorically. I'm not <laughs> asking about myself. That's a long way off, I think. But Lord, guard, guide my spouse such that he or she will become a, a follower of you to see you as Lord and Savior. How will I be provided in my life in, the, in light of the fact that I live alone? Lord, will I be healed of this illness? Is it safe for me to participate in in-person worship? God, where are you in the midst of fill in the blank, job, career, relationship, parenting, and so on? We ask these questions all the time. How does God guide us? How does the Holy Spirit lead us? Well, here we find, I think, the story of the Apostle Paul and his companions uh, instructional, formative. Paul and his companions are on his second missionary journey. And from earlier, we learn about who makes up this little company. There is Silas and Paul and a young man named Timothy. And also in this very passage here from Acts 16, the narrator goes from the third person plural talking about they and them to talking about the first, uh, second person plural. No, first person plural. We, get my grammar right, <laughs> goes to talking about we. So well, who's the we in the we? That's where Luke joins the picture in Troas. So he's part of this apostolic company as well. Well, we're told that they went through the region of Phrygia in Galatia, and then it says something interesting. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. So just right there, how does the Spirit lead? just right there, on this journey, what do they find? The Holy Spirit is shutting doors, first of all, left and right, two times, two times. We don't know why these doors were shut, whether it was a vision that Paul had. He has a vision to go forward, as we know from our text today. Was it a vision? Was it a dream? Were their passports not renewed? <laughs> Had they run out of American Express checks? <laughs> Was it an intuition? Was it circumstantial? Did someone become sick? Did they lack inner peace? We're not told. But all along the way, we assume that the hand of God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was upon them, guiding them, and they didn't despair. They didn't give up. Sometimes, we despair because of closed doors. We come up against them. We've thought about it. We've not been rash. We've prayed about something. And it seems the, that the Lord is in it, too, but the doors remain closed. What are we to do? 
number of years ago, I was attending my church's uh, men's retreat. I was on staff in uh, a church in South Carolina, and uh, we were at uh, Canuga Conference Center, and we had a speaker, uh, Reverend Mark, um, uh, Marcus Robertson. And I remember Mark saying on that weekend as he was talking about uh, the story of Moses, he said this, quote, God will not lead you away from someplace until God leads you to someplace. And at that time, I was beginning to uh, pray with CJ about our next steps, having been there a few years in South Carolina, and um, I really felt as though it was God's will that we come out here to Colorado, anywhere in Colorado, where I grew up. But the doors were constantly being closed during that time. Finally, the door was open here at St. Gabriel's 17 years ago. Well, since that time, thinking about what Mark Robertson said that time at that men's retreat, that God does not call you away from something until God calls you to something, I've had a little bit of a, a nuance to that, a little bit of a, a coda to that view, and that is this. Sometimes God doesn't call us to something except when we can think about that being called to, to a place of rest a place of discernment, a place to sit and wait upon the Lord. Maybe you are called out of something to go somewhere, out of some situation or another like a job change. But rather than being called right away to another job, maybe you're called to a time of rest, a time of sitting in the presence of God, praying, listening, watching, waiting. And that can really be nerve-wracking. But maybe that's what God's plan is all along. Well, anyway, eventually the disciples, uh, the uh, Apostle Paul and his companions, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they go to Europe through Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Well, how does this come about? A couple times, the Spirit of the Lord closes the door. The Holy Spirit closes the door. Now the door opens, and the Spirit is there as well. Paul has a vision. This man from Macedonia comes to him in in his vision and says to him, Come to Macedonia. Come over and help us. Pretty exciting, right? How do we know elements of understanding God's will? I wish I had time to develop these here a little bit more, but these are some that, in my study this week, uh, were put out on a, uh, by a website. It's sort of, I, I collected them here for us to think about here. How do we know the leading of the Spirit? How does the Spirit lead us? Number one, God guides us through both open doors and closed doors, as we have seen. We've already seen this in the experience of Paul, John Stott, the commentator, uh, points out in numerous places in in history among missionaries that they thought they were going to go to one place called the one place, and God calls them to another place. For instance, David Livingston wanted to go to China, but he was sent to the steppes of Africa instead. William Carey, the great Baptist missionary, wanted to go to Polynesia, but he was sent to India. Adoniram Judson went to India first, but then he was called to Burma. God works through closed doors as well as open doors. We can't always know for certain how God's going to guide us, but one thing we can be certain of is that God holds us in the palm of God's hand. The next thing, guidance. God's guidance isn't just circumstantial, looking at the circumstances It's also rational. These disciples concluded that God was calling them to go to Macedonia. They used their brains, godly wisdom. The implication of the sense of being concluding is that it's like the pieces of the puzzle began to fit together. It's not some sort of roll of the dice in the dark 
to try to understand God's will. It's not certainly con contacting a Ouija board or using horoscopes or doing those kinds of things or fortune tellers. Those are spiritually dangerous, by the way. But God works through our judgment and discernment, our wisdom to guide us. Well, we also see here, by way of example, that God's guidance is both individual and communal. Do you have a Bible study group, a prayer group, a spiritual director with whom you can share what you're wrestling with and perhaps let them speak into your life? Perhaps God is using a small group of friends, prayer partner, spiritual director to speak God's truth and will into your life. You're not alone. One of the great benefits of small group opportunities is for us to gather together and to have people who know us and love us ask questions. And it may not be them telling us what to do, but rather raising the right questions so that we see things differently. Knowing God's will can happen individually and communally. And then finally, God's will unfortunately sometimes for us, can happen gradually or unexpectedly. <laughs> and sometimes we don't know God's will and purposes, the Holy Spirit's leading, until we look in the rearview mirror. And then we see, aha, God, you were with me. And I would say that is often the case. We want to know God's will in a particular situation but all, sometimes, maybe oftentimes, it's only when we look in the rear view can we actually see it. Pastor Tim Keller uh, talks about it this way. He says, it's like driving up a mountain road. We can think of Independence Pass, for instance. You know, you're coming up out of uh, Twin Lakes, and uh, the road ascends, and you go for a long time in the trees, and you go on the switchbacks back and forth, and then eventually you come out, and you can see the valley before you on either side. He says sometimes understanding God's will is getting to a vantage point uh, that you couldn't see it or understand it until you had gotten to that particular point. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 61, and favorite line of that psalm is the first one, which says, Lord, set me upon a rock that is higher than I. Give me your perspective, because I can't see it. Anybody a hiker here? You know what a false summit is? <laughs> Once you get up to the true summit, you can actually see things as they are. The Spirit leads Paul and his companions to go to Philippi. Well, that's the first part of the story here today, and it, it really can be summarized as God, the Holy Spirit, leading in the day-to-day. -day. Paul wanted to go here. God sent him over here. But in the second part of the story, which is the story of Lydia, we see the Holy Spirit's leading in eternal ways, with her soul, with her spirit. Just want to focus on that one briefly, too. Here we see the Spirit of God leading as well. They finally get to Philippi, which is a leading city of the area. It was a Roman colony. It was filled with uh, retired military people. And they went to go uh, teach there on the Sabbath. It doesn't mention a synagogue. Perhaps there wasn't a synagogue. And so they do the next best thing. They go down to the river where they think there's a place to pray. They assume there's a pr place to pray. You don't have to be in church. You can actually be out on the, on the stream. Uh, but they take that opportunity to meet with a group of women who are down there, and they begin to share the message. One of them is a, a woman named Lydia. What do we know about her? Well, it says she's from Thyatira. Where's Thyatira? It's in modern-day Turkey. Where's Philippi? Modern-day Greece. Lydia is not a native Philippian. She's from, from elsewhere. It says she's a God-fearer. That's a technical term. It says that she was 
uh, she knew about uh, the Jewish God. She was perhaps curious, perhaps to become a convert uh, there. She was a dealer in purple cloth, a purple dye. What else do we know about her from that? Interesting what you learn when you study here, but this particular dye we're, come, we're led to understand comes from the mucus of a marine snail. This is something that is pretty hard to access. These would be luxury goods that she was selling. You know, Louis Vuitton, Hermes, those kinds of products, Prada. This probably was a very wealthy woman. Doesn't mention her family, but it talks about her household. She was probably a, an influential woman. And finally, we're told about her, the Spirit moves in her heart. The Lord opened her heart to hear and understand what Paul is saying. For our purposes here, I, I, the most important thing about Lydia is I want you to know that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, gave Lydia spiritual eyes to see and embrace the message that Paul was bringing. So this morning, we're talking about the leading of the Holy Spirit. In the day-to-day, and also from an eternal perspective on our own hearts. Paul didn't know that Lydia that day would come to the knowledge and love of God and Christ, however it was articulated, but he made himself available. No synagogue? No problem. I'll share with you at the riverside. We'll go down to the river to pray. The Spirit used Paul to bring Lydia into the household of faith. Well, my time is up. I've probably gone beyond 10 minutes. <laughs> but let me put it this way. What do we now discover about the work of God through his Spirit? God works through closed doors and open doors. We come to see God's will through prayer, through discernment, godly wisdom, communally as people speak into our lives, raise the right questions, through circumstances, and sometimes through the rearview mirror, and sometimes waiting and being quiet and centered is the space that we need to hear the small voice of God speaking into our lives. Circumstances are beyond our control. So we make the best of the situation. And the people who abide in God's will are adaptable and flexible. And most of all, they're open to be used by God to bless other people. Lydia is held up as the first convert in Europe. We might not be here had not Paul received that vision from the Spirit to go to Macedonia, had not Lydia been at the river that day to listen to the message of Paul, to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit in her life. At the end of the day, all praise and glory belong to God. Amen. I invite you to stand now with me as you are able, turning in the prayer book to the Nicene Creed or in your online version. In the prayer book, the Nicene Creed is found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, 
he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. special intercessions and thanksgivings on our long-term prayer list, we pray for Peter and Barbara Judd, Rhea Miller, Tom Allen, and Silva, Sylvia Verser, Matthew and Martha Blue, Karen Kane, and Jane Wetmore. We give thanks for those celebrating birthdays this week, especially Ann Cosby, Marilyn Crow, Diane Mounts, Joe Poole, Mike Cosby, Colby White, Kay Ward, Megan Donnelly, Joanne Evans, Mary James, Ron Young, Adrian James, Greg Sweeney. We give thanks for those celebrating for anniversaries, especially Matt and Sidney DeRigi, David and Barbara Harris. In joy and hope, let us pray to the Father that our risen Savior may fill us in our community with joy of his glorious and life-giving resurrection. We pray to the Lord, hear our prayer, that isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the good news of Easter, and that Jesus' followers would lead by example in promoting peace and justice. We pray to the Father that God may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. We pray to the Father that he may provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. We pray to the Father that by his power, war and famine may cease through all the world. We pray to the Father. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the weak and the sick, especially Hugh Sweeney, George Evans, Larry Ellis, Phil Swank, Margaret Swank, Jim Tallman, Eric Bowman, Lynn Lawler, Margie Langstaff, the West family, Bill Thomas, Tim Clute, Steve and John Poole, Blake Holst. Are there others? We pray to the Father that according to his promises, all who have died in the faith of the resurrection may be raised on the last day especially Sue Baker and Cynthia Pickard McReady and victims of the shootings in Buffalo, New York and Laguna Woods, California. We pray to the Father that he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people so that we may bear faithful witnesses to his resurrection. We pray to the Father. Heavenly Father, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as his death has recalled us to life, 
so his continual presence in us may raise us to eternal joy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please greet one another with the peace of Christ. I invite you to be seated as we have a little time of uh, greeting and sharing about life and community here at St. Gabriel's. A special welcome to those who are guests here today. It's a joy uh, to have you with us. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about St. Gabriel's Church, uh, one way to do that is to complete the pew card in the pew rack in front of you and place it in the offering plate as it comes through in just a moment's time. Also, too, we'd love to greet you after the service, and we have coffee and refreshments in the parish hall, uh, too, if you'd like to join us. Uh, today, uh, we have a little cleanup party going on after the service. Uh, the grounds around here took a little hit uh, with the downed trees yesterday, and uh, so we lo love to kind of clean those up. I actually brought a little uh, show and tell here, just uh, forgot about bringing that out here. But yes, um, brought this and, and loppers and uh, uh, ch chainsaws and those kinds of things. It'll just help... Um, clean the space up. So if you can join us, uh, great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the service for our dear friend and sister in Christ, Sue Baker, will be held this coming Thursday, uh, which is Ascension Day. Uh, just putting that piece together in my mind, um, how appropriate to honor Sue and remember her and celebrate the Lord's Ascension to the right hand of the Father. Death does not have the last word. Uh, that service will be at 2 o'clock here in the afternoon and invite you to join in support of her family, and, uh, and, and thank you for that. I'd like to invite Philip Jolis to come and share with us about the upcoming fishing trip, the annual fishing trip that we have that Philip puts together. Uh, Philip, how many years is this, do you think? Uh, six. About six. Very good. Seven. Well, wonderful. Can you just share a little bit about it? Thank you. Um, I'll be brief, but in two Saturdays, so June 4th, not next Saturday, but the Saturday after that. We're going to have a St. Gabriel's Fishing Day. It's down at Lake Lehow, and I've got directions on the, on the board out there. You can look it up and, and contact me if you need how to get there. Just bring a lunch, bring some sunscreen. You don't need a fishing license. You don't need fishing equipment. You don't even know how to fish. <laughs> I, I was out there with some Boy Scouts uh, last week, and it was fishing tremendous. And I'm going to have some disabled vets out there this week, and we're looking at a wonderful trip. And so it should be perfect for all of you, and it's wheelchair accessible. So if any of you are unsteady on your feet, we can get you right down to the water, you know, right with your car, and you can fish right from there. So, you know, please come and have a wonderful time, and we look forward to it. And if you know some people in your neighborhood just moved in, you want to invite them to St. Gabriel's, don't know how to do it, maybe take them to the fishing day, and then they might want to come to church afterwards. So thank you. Thanks, Philip. Very good. The following day then, June the 5th, is Pentecost, and it's also the day when we have our parish picnic, annual parish picnic, uh, here at the church, and uh, there are sign-ups online and also on the bulletin board in the parish hall, different items that you can bring and help us with. The vestry provides the, the main dishes, if you will, the hot dogs and hamburgers and those kinds of things, and we just ask you to bring some things to share with others. That's coming up on June the 5th, always a fun time. And then the arts camp that you've been hearing about will be on June the 6th through the 10th. And that's for our younger uh, church members. And Meg, do you want to add anything to that? Or uh, let me uh, go ahead. I will come up 
I'll defer to you. There we go. Um, Meg, you need this, though. Up to your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Sign your kids up for Arts Camp. It's going to be an awful lot of fun, and we need volunteers to help prepare ahead of time and with the week. So contact either myself or Sheila Martin. Thanks. Thanks, Meg. Today is also the day when we are honoring graduates from the congregation, uh, both our own youth as well as uh, those uh, who are uh, further afield. But remembering today and giving thanks for Brennan Dorigi, uh, Grace Ditzenberger, uh, Abby Lane, Kai Owens, Madison Smith, Ben Tate, Spencer Off, and Priscilla Stecker, all who have graduated uh, from uh, college or medical school or uh, graduate school and, uh, or high school. And so we give thanks for them, and please remember them in your prayers as they take their next steps. And then finally today we have a prayer quilt uh, for Lilla Montoya, who is a dear friend of Margie Stewart's, and she's had cancer treatment for liver cancer, I believe, kidney cancer, excuse me, and she's having complications in the treatment. And so we want to pray for Lilla today. And also ask you af after the service to pray for her uh, when the prayer quilt is on the uh, table in the narthex. Let us pray for her. Lord God, our times are in your hand, and we lift up before you Lilla, asking your healing upon her body, mind, and spirit. May she know that she's walking in your sight and that you hold her in the palm of your hand. Bless those who attend to her needs medically, emotionally, spiritually. Bless her family and friends. All these things we ask in your holy and blessed name. Amen. Now let us with joy and gladness bring the offerings of our life and our labor unto the Lord.
Book of Common Prayer on page 367 or in your online version. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Paul, Silas, Luke, Timothy, and Lydia, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ.
This morning, Roger is bringing communion to Lynn Lawler. If you turn over your handout, uh, we have our Eucharistic visitor uh, liturgy. Please join with me. Roger, we send you out to share communion this week. And may Lynn, who receives it from you, be strengthened and encouraged in that community we have together in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our post-communion prayer is found on page 365. Together, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our, you are able, I invite you to stand for the blessing. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and be with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. 
Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.